I didn't become properly vegan until I became an activist. And before long, it happened to me, it's happened to many, many other people, they think, well, well, I could have said that. <laughs> and it's the default position. It, it's a... Hi, and thank you for tuning into my YouTube channel, my podcast. My name's Rebecca, and I'm the Vegan Pixie Warrior. Today, I'm going to be interviewing a fellow activist and friend of mine, Paul Yud. Hi, Paul. Thanks for coming. Hi, Rebecca. My pleasure. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thanks. Very well. I did a little um, quarter of a mile run this morning just to get the, the legs pumping again. And then okay. I planted some potatoes. <laughs> Amazing. So we're going to be talking to Paul about his activism and his story of how he went vegan. So can I ask Paul, what led you to become vegan? And, uh, remember in the early 2000s when BSE, mad cow disease, was rampant, mm -hmm. I thought, well, the easy way to avoid that is not to eat meat. So I gave up eating meat. And, uh, and that, I found that fairly easy. I didn't really have a problem with that. And uh, I don't know why or how or what happened, but I started to look at the uh, uh, animal industry. I looked at dairy, first of all, and I thought, I suddenly realised how cows were uh, mistreated. And, um, and, I, and I gave up uh, dairy. But I still like goat's cheese. I thought, well, goats are all right. So, I, and then I started looking at the way goats were treated. So I went on to sheep's cheese, and eventually I looked at sheep's cheese, and I gave it all up. And uh, at the same time, I think it was on Channel Four, uh, there was a documentary about, and it was how chicken. This was in early two thousands or mid two thousand when they they showed that male chicks were killed at birth. And, uh, and I thought, well, I don't want to be a part of that. So that was it, gone. I, I became, I, I won't say now vegan, but I became plant-based. I didn't become properly vegan until I became an activist. And I realized I'd been carrying a leather bloody wallet around with me for, <laughs> for aeons. And uh, so I got, it was with, uh, it was with Gail at uh, Gail Broom at, uh, at Bath uh, Veg uh, Fest, I think it was. And, um, well, I was walking around there, they had this store where they were selling all leather goods. And I thought, suddenly realized I've got a leather belt on and I've got a leather wallet. So that went, and then I became vegan. In between that, there was a, a five year wrangle with my wife who wanted a leather sofa, and I didn't want a leather sofa. And it took about five years for us to finally, we got we have a full leather sofa now, a suede type thing, and it's rather nice. Oh, that's good. So how old are you, if you mind me asking, when you went vegan? And how old are you now? I was, I was about um, in my mid-60s, uh, I would say, yeah. It took two years, I should say, two years from, from going, uh, uh, giving up meat to, to get all, for all the blinkers to come off and realising that, you know, I shouldn't be part of this animal cruelty anymore. Just proves that it's, it's never too late to go vegan. Indeed, no. Uh, and... Uh, it's never too late to do anything, I've just, I've just proved it. <laughs> yeah, we'll really. come on to that in a bit, actually. It's pretty impressive. So, do you mind me asking, I know you should never ask a lady her age, but I'm sure it's different for a man, can you tell me how old you are, Paul? I know this anyway, but for yeah. the viewers. I'll be 83 in September. Wow. And you've, how has ve the vegan lifestyle affected your health? Well, if you can see my hands, you see how gnarled and twisted they are, I can't make a fist. Mm -hmm. uh, they're both the same, I can't, that's about as far as I can go. My arthritis, this, this was osteoarthritis, and it was getting worse every year. My fingers were getting more and more twisted. But when I became vegan, and I could, but I couldn't shake hands, I couldn't uh, hold a kettle, I couldn't pull up a duvet without pain, I couldn't change gear. And then once I became vegan, that pain disappeared. I, I don't have arthritis anymore. I'm completely free of, of, of any pain. Uh, so that was uh, the big thing. And then um, I, get, I, I, st I stopped smoking when I got married 50 years ago, nearly 50 years ago. Uh, but I smoked for about 13 years and, and I had a chronic cough about seven, six or seven years ago. And I had a hernia operation scheduled. And I said to the doc, can I get rid of this hernia, this, this cough before I have the hernia operation? So he sent me to a specialist. They diagnosed that I damaged the base of the lungs. And uh, there was, it was um, mucus which he collected, which became infected. So they gave me a 28-day course of uh, antibiotics. I got rid of that. And I have 
I was I was diagnosed with COPD, but it was COPD. Then they changed that to uh, bronchi ecstasis, and now I don't think I've got that anymore. I think that's gone. I think I'm well. Yeah, I don't have any breathing problems, or you know, I, I'm just completely fit and and yeah. That's incredible. I, I, I'm on no medications. I don't have any any uh, meds at all. Which is very unusual for someone of your age to not be on any medication at all. Yeah. I mean, usually on statins or some that's sort right, of heart medication, yeah. but that's not the case with you, and that's amazing. There is one thing I know that you can do with your hands now. What's that? Because your arthritis is gone. And it's the dumbbells, isn't it? I've got a, a, a kettlebell. Kettlebell. Yeah, yeah, I've got my nine kilogram kettlebell, which I swing around once a, every five days. I, I try and do it. I've got a set of nine exercises and I do about 20 reps. Well, it takes me a few minutes, but it just keeps me... Wow. Well. And there's no way you would have been able to do that if you couldn't even pull the duvet up or shake yeah. a hand. Indeed, of course. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that myself. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I couldn't have lifted it. Yeah. That's fantastic. So, what inspired you to take part in this challenge that you've just done? So. I don't want to ruin it. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna let you tell the story. So you've recently completed a challenge at home. You're in lockdown at the moment. Yeah. Obviously, you're self-isolating because of your age. Even though your health is perfect. Yeah. What's inspired you to do what you've done? Tell well, people what you've done. Well, it's been on my mind. I've got a friend, Steve Clark, uh, who's uh, and, and also Gay, uh, Gail Broom, who are both runners. They both belong to vegan runners, and it's been on the back of my mind. I wouldn't mind doing a park run. Uh, just to uh, see if I can do it, and um, I thought I'd, I'd, ask, I'd actually asked for running shoes at Christmas uh, for, for a Christmas present, but my family poo-pooed it, and I didn't get them. <laughs> but uh, when the lockdown came, I thought, how can I put this lockdown to good use and come out of it with a new skill? Let's try running. So I measured out a 20-yard track around the garden, around the back lawn in the garden. And started running, first of all, it was about a quarter of a mile I could manage, and then I built it up and built it up. And very quickly, I, I realized that, that I could, uh, that it was going very well. And I, I thought maybe I could do a 10K and raise money for uh, Dean Farm Trust with Sanctuary, which is uh, uh, Gail Broom's favorite sanctuary. She's always going up there and raving about how, what a great place it is. I've never been there, but uh, I, I certainly want to go there now. And I thought, why not combine, why not? raise some money by an 82 year old running 10k that be that should get a bit of interest but as i progress as i as i built up my uh, my training I, I i that suddenly became too small that target i thought why not just make a a light round number so why not do 100 kilometers in 10 days do a 10 day run every every day for 10 days uh, which i did and i th I, I thought initially i thought uh, it's going to get harder during the week. It's, it's really going to, by the end of the week, I'm, I'm in five, six, seven, eight days, and I'm going to be really shattered. But the opposite happened. As I went into that 10 days, as I went through it, I got fitter and stronger. And I have no aches, no pains, no, uh, no and, and yet conversely, 40 years ago, I'd started running. Um, I thought I could, but I ran for about six weeks and my knees were so painful that I, that I, I gave it up and bought a bike and I've never run since. But this time, it must be the plant-based diet. It's giving me no other explanation. I've got no aches, no pains. Uh, the only thing was, I could, if I had a, initially when I sat down, if I sat too long, I could be really stiff when I walk, when I walk, when I moved again. But after after about halfway through, that disappeared. I didn't have any stiffness any longer. I just got stronger and stronger. And in the end, I thought, even through the 10-day challenge, I thought I could do better than this. So I ended up doing 110k in the 10 days. Just to, and, and part of my impetus was to raise money for Dean Farm, obviously. But the other thing was to show you can be fit and healthy and strong into old age as a vegan. Should I ever get there? I think it's a, a great way of doing some vegan activism as well. Because you know, you're 82, you're running in the back garden and you ran consistently for 10 days in a row. Now, you know, I've just started taking up running again. And yeah. I used to, like yourself, I used to run years ago before I moved um, to the city I'm in now, I was running quite a lot, but I would take a couple of days to recover. But one thing I've noticed now is that 
after a, you know, the next day of running, I'm ready to go out again. I'm not, yeah. I'm taking a day's break in between, but my recovery time is so much better. And I'm older, I'm in my 40s now. Yeah. I was in my- Well, if you, look at, if you look at the Game Changers, uh, the film, The Game Changers, all the athletes have gone vegan. That's the one thing that they all have in common. Their recovery time is that much quicker. Yeah. You can get out and do more training and become stronger. And can I ask you when and why you became an animal rights activist? Well, about two and a half years ago uh, now, I guess, um, early 2018, maybe Christmas 2017, I, I started, I came across uh, Joey Carbstrong and James, well, it was James Aspie, first of all, and Gary Urofsky. And I thought, I need to do something. I can't just sit on the sidelines. And but nothing was, a, there was nothing in my area uh, that I could join, and I'm not one for initiating projects. So I'm, a, I'm a follower rather than a leader. But in uh, in April that year, 2018, Steve Klaus started AV Taunton, and I thought, right, I, I'll be in this. And uh, so I joined AV Taunton. Uh, a bit nervous, of course. We're all a bit nervous when we start, but I found very quickly that it was a really it was empowering. You were actively doing something. You felt that you were making a difference. But apart from that. I, I gained a whole new family of, of vegan activists, <laughs> which I call my second family. And now it, it wasn't long before I had uh, friends stretching from Exeter, Barnstable, right up to Swindon, Cheltenham, all over the Southwest. I, 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 I would meet friends. I would go to Bath and do a, a, a cube in Bath or Bristol where we, where we met. And um, I just absolutely loved it. And, and uh, I had a good traveling companion with, with Gail Broom and then uh, Simone Rolfe would, would go together and we would, 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 would travel up to, to these places and go down to Exeter and then um, yeah go to Yeovil. Well I started Yeovil um, because Yeovil had fallen in abeyance and uh, Steve Clark asked me if I'd help him start Yeovil. That was a year ago about it yeah about uh, 14 months ago. So we started AV Yeovil with the intention of doing it for six months and then if somebody came forward, we could leave it and, uh, and let them get on with it. With exactly what happened. Jay Warren stepped up and he took over AV Yeovil. And we were just going to start the same thing with Bridgewater when the lockdown happened. We had one cube there. Yeah. But, so, yeah, that's how we met, isn't it? We met at a cube in Bath in that, 2000. Yeah. And the Southwest, the Southwest cube, was it? I don't know if it was the Southwest one. It was, I started in September. So I don't know if the Southwest one was maybe earlier in the year, but was, the, I yeah. remember, I remember walking up and seeing you and Gail by Bath Abbey, and I think I did my first cube on the 26th of September 2018, and it was the following weekend, and I didn't, you know, didn't know you guys, and I felt an instant connection with both of you. It was just amazing, and I know you're an integral part of the AV family, and that everybody that meets you is inspired by you and you just give so much strength and knowledge um, and you're a very admired person and very highly respected in the in vegan activism movement especially in the, not just in the southwest your name is known mo much more broadly than that now um, but what do you find you know with the cubes like you said it, it, you found it easy and it does give you an empowerment i, I feel the same thing what would you say to somebody who is nervous about coming to a cube for the similar reasons that you might have been nervous the first time you went? Yeah, it is a bit, uh, especially if you're an introvert and you're not used to speaking to people, it, it can be quite daunting. But the beauty of the cube is that you just have to rock up, put a mask on and stay in the cube. And you don't have to do anything else but stand there with holding a laptop or a TV. And, and while you're doing that, you inevitably hear the conversations of, of the more experienced uh, cubers and, and before long it happened to me and it's happened to many many other people you think well well i could have said that <laughs> and, um, and and maybe uh, even oh i wouldn't have said that i would have put it a bit different and you begin to construct your own dialogue in your own in your mind and uh, and you it gains you gain confidence and then you go out and shadow somebody who's actually uh, uh, more experienced and and it, it's a sort of an, uh, a very smooth natural evolution from from the cube into into outreach 
Yeah, and you get a definitely, sorry, you, you definitely get a lot of support from the other activists. Oh, well, you do, you do indeed, yeah. There's no, you're never on your own. You're always, you're part of a group, you're part of a family. And, and that, one of the beauties about getting together with like-minded people is that you don't have to watch what you're saying, do you? You can speak freely and just be your natural self without having to consider the sensibilities of other people. And yeah, great, without great. defending your veganism. Indeed, yeah, yeah, that's a great bonus. And then, of course, there's three parts to the cube. Everybody says, oh, there's two parts to the cube. There's the, uh, you're in the cube or you're outreaching, but there's a third part, which you and I know well, where you socialize afterwards and you get to know the people that you've been working with and you become, you build those strong bonds that, uh, that carry you forward, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I've, I've made friendships that I know I'm going to have for life. Yeah, um, yeah. Definitely, 100%. And one of the great things about meeting you was that um, when I organised my first animal rights march last year in Bristol, you agreed to speak. And your speech was focused on activism, which was brilliant. That's exactly what I think we need more activists to get a vegan world. Otherwise, we're not going to achieve animal liberation. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, my message then was it's never too late to become an activist. Uh, and, and, it, and it's the default position. It's, it's exactly as Earthling Ed said, when you see a dog being beaten in the street, you can either join in, you can either walk past or you can stop him. Uh, and, and, and you've got to stop the police people abusing animals. It's, it's the default position. A hundred percent. I I never tire of talking to you, even though I, when we're at a cube and there's new people there, I hear the, your stories of how you've been vegan, but and that's the main reason I wanted to interview you because I feel that your story will help other people make that step. So I really want to thank you for agreeing to this. That's all right, Rebecca. All right, it's been my pleasure. Absolutely. Always enjoyed talking to you. <laughs> and I can't wait to see you on the streets again. Hopefully Indeed. it won't be too yeah. long. Yeah. So thanks everyone for watching. And um, thank you, Paul, for joining me. Don't forget to click subscribe click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. If you'd like to find more about um, the Kiba Truth, then I'll pop a link below. I'll also pop a link below to my Patreon page if you want to support me in launching more videos. Thanks again. Bye.